In March 2018, we opened our doors to the public with a vision not just to create challenging professional theatre, but to use this as a platform to inspire and bring communities together. Theatre and culture build identity. With theatre and culture in our local life, the community landscape is more vibrant. Local life is enriched. We believe that the benefits of theatre should be available for everyone. Our Theatre for All programme has removed financial barriers, giving disadvantaged people access to the theatre free of charge. So we were told that we'd come here and have a Christmas meal and then go and watch A Christmas Carol. Our aim is to make live professional theatre available to everyone and use that experience for positive change. Theatre can be transformational in young lives. Our academy is now in its fourth year and we continue to build on our vision of bringing the best performing arts tuition to the heart of the Cotswolds. We work hard to make our academy as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Discounts apply for parents with more than one child. Our bursaries help support talented children from less affluent backgrounds. The academy creates a fun and challenging environment where children can build friendships and develop key skills not just for theatre, but for life. We are also able to provide real opportunities for students who wish to pursue careers in the arts. My name is Harry Apps. I am currently playing Marius in Les Miserables in the West End. Barn outreach and learning programmes engage with thousands of people. Our free workshops support the drama curriculum in local schools. Singing and musical theatre workshops in community groups and care homes have helped address issues of isolation. Our Song for Sirencester project in aid of mental health charities brought our community together in an unprecedented way. We've collaborated with many charities in the region, including the Churn Project, to support individuals dealing with the barriers to finding work. Since working at UAN, my life's changed. It's given me some purpose, given me an interest, some confidence I was lacking prior to all this. The Barn Theatre played a pivotal role in the town's 2018 World War I centenary celebrations. Who could forget our record-breaking human poppy? Our live streaming work on the annual Advent Festival helped thousands engage and take part in Sirencester's Christmas festivities. In these times of uncertainty, we strive to keep the community together. The theatre may be temporarily closed, but our commitment to you goes on. Even now, our amazing costume department are helping the NHS by making scrubs for frontline workers. We've used our technology to build a free live streaming service that provides much needed community news and entertainment for all the family. Broadcasting every day to keep us all connected. We are not just a theatre. We are the bar. Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Cotswold District Council Live. I'm Councillor Joe Harris, I'm the leader of Cotswold District Council and your host today. And today I'm joined by Councillor Jenny Ford, who is our Cabinet Member for Health and Wellbeing. And we're also joined by Councillor Andrew Doherty, who is our Cabinet Member for Waste and Recycling and who alongside me is now becoming a bit of a fixture of this set here at the Barn Theatre. So thank you both for joining me. 
We're going to be with you for about um, half an hour to 45 minutes. Uh, we've got a slightly um, slimmed down show today. Um, we're going to be with you, as I said, for between 30 minutes and 45 minutes. We'll be having a bit of a chat with um, Andy and with Lisa, um, uh, Lisa and with um, and with Jenny. My apologies, my apologies, Jenny. And um, yeah, we'll be talking through some of the week's um, events, have an update on waste, have an update on the community. Um, and then, of course, as we usually do, we will take questions and answers. We've got a number of pre-prepared questions that have been submitted in advance, and we'll also be taking your questions um, as you post them on social media, on Facebook, and indeed on Twitter. Before we begin, uh, as is customary now, I want to say a massive thank you to all of those who are working in our NHS um, facilities here in the Cotswolds in Gloucestershire, and of course, across the country. Thank you for the ultimate sacrifice that many of you are making. We appreciate it, and your sacrifice will not be forgotten once this pandemic is over. I also want to say a massive thank you to all of our key workers who are working in our communities, care staff and those providing support to the most vulnerable in our society. And of course, a massive thank you to all the council staff that continue to work in our council, out, um, you know, the refuse collectors, a whole, a whole range of people doing diverse jobs in really, really difficult circumstances, ensuring that our services continue to function. So let's first of all go to Councillor Jenny Ford. Um, as I mentioned, Jenny is our cabinet member for waste and for waste and recycling. That's Andy. Andy, you're having too much of an effect on me. We've, we've spoken too much about the bins and waste over the past few weeks. It's starting to, uh, it's starting to rub off. Um, Jenny is our Cabinet Member for Health and Wellbeing. And Jenny, obviously we had the announcement now from, from the Prime Minister on Sunday evening and the subsequent um, <coughs> clarification, I think it's fair to say, um, yesterday. Give us a bit of an overview. What does it mean for the Cotswolds? You know, what's your sort of take on that? Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Joe. It's a it's a good question and one that I was immediately online and looking up and researching and and trying to figure out what the implications were for our residents in the Cotswolds. I mean, our residents have been, you know, first of all, just to say they have been brilliant um, at the social distancing and adhering to the rules during lockdown, um, and that's been reflected, I think, in the number of cases that we have in the Cotswolds and the number of deaths and. Um, They've been really fantastic at rallying around in their neighbourhoods and looking after each other and supporting each other through it. Um, so that's been brilliant. And our issues have always been with people coming outside of the area into the district. Um, you know, it's a beautiful place. It's a popular tourist destination. And um, we did have some problems um, at the... Um, at the beginning of the lockdown with people coming as far away as Enfield and Birmingham and all sorts of distances to come to Borton on the Water and Bybury in particular. Um, and that started to get better, um, but we're obviously, we're really concerned that now, you know, people are allowed to exercise you know, for an unlimited amount of time and they're allowed to drive uh, for long distances to, to get that exercise. Um, we're just a bit concerned that, you know, there's going to be a, a massive rush of people um, coming to the Cotswolds and we Jenny, just, on, on, yeah. sorry to interrupt. On 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 that point, this I think a lot of been a lot has been made, hasn't it, of the the term "stay alert," hasn't it? Uh, which I think is probably I think most people would agree, um, and probably indeed um, some members of the government it is a bit ambiguous and it is open to sort of in interpretation, isn't it? Yeah. In it, the in the yeah. in the context of the Cotswolds, then what would you you know what would your advice be on that? Um, so, yeah, I agree with you, and um, I have some concerns um, around the phrase stay alert because I think people are already at a high level of anxiety um, already, um, and I think the term stay alert has kind of just added to that, and I don't think it's really been particularly helpful. Um, we are just really urging people to utilise common sense not rush to the Cotswolds, not descend particularly on our popular um, <laughs> tourist areas. Um, and, um, you know, also, you know, not leaving the place where you live um, to stay at another house for a holiday or to come and visit second homes. That is still very, very clear under the legislation that people are absolutely not meant to start opening up Airbnb or holiday homes or visiting second homes. You know, that is still cate categorical. This is primarily around people um, accessing the outside. And we're really lucky here that we've got, 
lots of beautiful places but we say to people if you do love the Cotswolds and you do love this place it's still going to be here for the foreseeable future um, just hang on in there and don't you know descend on us because it will not only affect um, our residents health but it may potentially affect yours as well I mean the other thing to say is that um, you know it's not really going to help us with our uh, economic recovery either because nothing's open so even if they come here um, you know there isn't going to be anywhere for them to spend their money there may not be anywhere for them to access any of the services and they may just create more waste and environmental impact um, which I'm sure you know Andy will back me up on is you know it's not going to be great for our environmental services either so absolutely yeah I'll tell you what, on, on, on that theme, should we have this week's um, bin update? I think, <laughs> I, think, I think we should go to the bin update. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll have that. I'm so sorry about the jingle, everybody. Um, <laughs> it's the first time I've heard the sound. I love yeah. the jingle. Is that really? It's the first time That's you've heard the, the sound? first time I've heard the sound. Yeah. So while we've been laughing, you, you haven't actually realised why yeah. we've been laughing. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it adds a bit of gravitas to what um, you know, to what you say, Andy. I think that's a, not that not that you not that you don't have lots of gravitas anyway. But anyway, right. Fire away. Give us our bin anyway. update for, uh, for for the week. Okay. So we obviously had quite a, a big bin update and a lot on the bins last week. So it's a bit shorter and simpler this week. So obviously, uh, big news for at least half of you, those of you who are subscribers, is that we're starting the garden waste collections up again tomorrow. That doesn't mean that you get a collection tomorrow because we're starting on the normal two-week cycle. So if you're due your main collection on a Wednesday, that's when it'll happen. If you do it on a Thursday, that's when it'll happen. Do it on a Friday, that's what'll happen. And then we roll into the second week and then we roll back to the first week. So if you look at your calendars, whatever it says on there is what we'd normally be doing. And the website is also up to date. If you want to check, you can look on there and it will tell you whether you're getting it reasonably soon or whether you've got a little longer to wait before that collection comes. The garden waste service is mostly coming back on stream because we started to resolve some of the capacity problems we've had in other places, particularly related to the larger volumes of recycling and food in particular that come through. So our team at Ubico have done a great job literally out with welding torches and other bits of proper mechanical equipment, making changes to the recycling lorries so we can reconfigure those, free up the capacity we need, and that enables us to get those garden waste lorries back out and going. When garden waste restarts, capacity is still going to be a concern. So one of the important things to bear in mind is we're trying to be very clear with people. We can only take those bins that have already got licenses on them and we can't take side waste and we can't take an arbitrarily large number of bags if you put them out. So for most people, we're saying, for example, if you've got the paper bags, put three out, that's a kind of a normal bins equivalent. And the reason for that is that the lorries are only a certain size. There is only a certain amount of space particularly when we go up to the North Cotswolds, it takes an hour's drive to get up there, get the lorry filled, and then go where we're going next, which is right down to the south of the Cotswolds, to empty that garden waste out again. So we need to keep a cap on how much we can take, otherwise we'll have big problems with the service. So the big thing we're asking people to do is to bear that in mind, it's there for a reason, and if you've got more waste, which I don't doubt a lot of you do have, stagger it gradually over the next few weeks. We're also encouraging people to do things like no mow may and try and cut down on the amount of lawn mow you're doing because that'll help us all cut up down on the backlog of material that needs to go into the system. Once we've got the backlog dealt with, we'll have a bit more capacity. We'll start to do things like open up for people who want to order additional bins and that'll give you more room if you need it. But we need to get through that first hump where there's a lot of stuff to pick up and get off the ground to be able to deliver the service properly. I think that's probably the kind of key messages in terms of the waste service at the minute. Fantastic. Thank you, Andy. Concise as ever and, and, and clear. Appreciate it. Um, right, we're starting to get a few questions trickling through, um, which is great. So keep those coming and we will answer as many as we possibly can. Um, here we've got a few that have been asked in advance, either by email or through social media. So we've got one here from the old post office um, on Twitter, which is a and b up in the North Cotswolds. Um, when will the discretionary grants be allocated and how quickly will they be paid? As a council tax paying B&B, we've not received one dime um, to date, um, and yet we've just had our closure extended by at least another two and a half weeks. Um, so, first of all, um, first thing to say is we're really sorry to hear about the difficulties that you and your businesses, um, you know, that all businesses are facing um, at the minute. 
I believe that you fall into the category um, for the business grants that were announced on May the second by the government. We're really keen to get those paid out, but we haven't had any um, we haven't had any guidance from the government yet um, about how these should be administered, who they should go to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're waiting to hear um, hear from the government on that. We were expecting to hear last week on the seventh of May. Haven't heard anything to date. Um, but we hope to, hopefully, we were told it would be early this week, hopefully we'll hear by the end of today, if not tomorrow. So we should have some, hopefully, some some good news on that. And we will, again, we will aim to administer them as quickly as possible. But um, I know that you sent me an email on this, so, um, so we'll make sure that um, you're first in the queue when it comes to filling out an application form and getting that in. So, um, so rest assured, we will do our best. Andy, question for you from Julia Taylor. Um, I'd love to know when the um, Foscross Recycling Centre is reopened. Thank you. Um, so the recycl uh, household waste recycling centres are Gloucestershire County Council and they're running them and they're doing a staggered opening of the recycling centre so they can work out what does and doesn't work. I uh, don't know if you've seen online but there was quite a lot of news coverage I noticed when other recycling centres across the countries opened up and you had kind of mile long queues that were taking three hours for people to get in and this kind of stuff was going on. So Foss Cross, I think, is a particular difficulty for them just because of where it is and the narrowness of the road on the way in. So there is a concern if big, crew, um, if big um, queues build up, it's going to be hard to get vehicles in and out. So as I understand it at the minute, and they've announced more about this publicly on their website and through their channels, they're opening up certain of the recycling centres to begin with. They're looking to see how the booking system and how that works, and then they'll use that knowledge and experience to open up the next set. But key thing for that probably is to look to what Gloucestershire County Council is saying, because it's ultimately with them the decisions on when those get reopened. Great. Um, all sorts of visitors, um, or viewers, I should say. So we've got Tammy in Chesterton, we've got Denise in Eastleach, um, we've got Jane from her sofa in Sirencester, Mike from Morton, Barry in Kemble, Shout out to you all. Good to have you. Good to have you with us today. Um, so we've got a we've got a question from Rich James. Jenny, this is to you. This is your portfolio as well. So when do we know when the museum and tourist information um, might be opening? Um, the short answer uh, is no, um, and the longer answer is that we are um, looking at all of the guidance that is coming out. Um, in government around supporting leisure and um, the museum um, areas. Um, we're obviously keen to get things um, open again as soon as possible, um, especially our much loved um, and well renowned museum. Um, however, you know, as with all of these things, we've got to ensure that we can practice um, safe social distancing and that our staff are, um, are safe um, and that our residents are safe too. So um, we are working on that and it's, uh, yeah, it's basically work in progress. Okay, um, I've got another question actually from Rich as well. Um, can I visit my family in Brighton? <laughs> this, is a, uh, this is the debate, yeah, isn't it? It is <laughs> the debate and, it is, uh, and I know it feels really, really unclear. I think as with all of these things um, and as the police have been advising people, you have to kind of use your common sense really and ask yourself the question, um, does this feel like the right thing to do? Is it the sensible thing to do? Is it the reasonable thing to do? Am I going to be putting myself and others and particularly people that I love at risk if I make a very long journey um, and then I'm not able to get back or um, I'm not able to practice um, safe social distancing when I'm there? Um, I, I think the other thing to remember is that um, the, um, the, the coronavirus is still tragically claiming lives um, every day. It hasn't stopped, it hasn't gone anywhere, it hasn't actually dropped that much. So um, restricting movement is still, you know, in, in my view, is still a sensible thing to do. Um, and it's also um, showing increasingly in the evidence that's coming out that it passes much faster amongst um, close family units. Um, and we were just talking about this this morning, actually, and just saying, you know, if you meet up with somebody that is a much loved member of your family, I think the temptation to break that social distancing and to just have a quick hug or just have, you know, have that physical contact would be absolutely immense. So I can see why um, there is still, you know, quite a lot of restriction about close family units. So I think it's about people who have to start using their common sense and taking a bit of personal responsibility for um, what they're doing in terms of um, making that risk assessment. Melanie Butler on Facebook raises a good point and again, 
needs looking into. Um, need to check the internet. Holiday homes are allowing bookings now. Um, you can also book hotels in Sirencester. Um, please, can you look into this? Jenny, what would your sort of advice be? Uh, probably to get in touch with us and let us know. Yeah, absolutely. Get in touch with us. Let us know. Um, you know, as I say, at the beginning of the lockdown, this was still going on in some places. Um, I don't think there is um, any actual um, specific advice around not renting out your home as a holiday home but there is some very specific advice about not visiting a holiday home so um yeah that's the that's the confusion there i think for people but yes do let us know we can certainly contact people and just gently remind them um that we still are very much in in lockdown in all sorts of ways yeah and as i said repeat do do report that sort of thing to us you know we've got a you know the district council has been proactive in contacting usually holiday homeowners uh, and just making sure that the rules are being followed and that people aren't going to holiday homes and equally that they're not letting them out, of course, while we're in while we're in lockdown um, on the foreseeable. So, um, Andy, I just, want to, I just want to come to you for a second. I think it's fair to say you've probably learned quite a lot about the waste service, not only over the last year, but probably in the last, in the last um, couple of months since we've been in um, lockdown. What are the potential lessons that you've learned and... Is there scope for improvement? Um, well, there's always scope for improvement. So, I mean, take that as a yes. Oh, what what is that improvement given. then? What would you be advocating? I think um, one of the difficulties we have in our service is that we have, because we have a curbside sort service, it's unknown, it's relatively complicated. Um, one of the things that becomes apparent when we have a relatively complicated service is there are more things to go wrong. Um, we had some interesting problems with rolling out the, some of the changes to the service and if you're doing those at the same time as there is a worldwide pandemic then it gets a bit tricky to keep all of your plates spinning and up in the air so i mean key lesson is try not to do that again um, but again we picked this as a sensible time to roll out the new service because we weren't able to last year because the vehicles that we needed weren't going to be ready in time to actually launch the service on the date that had been provisionally set previously and so looking at those kinds of things, if you had known what was going to happen, you'd have staggered it, you'd have changed some of the things we did. We'd have had less reliance, for example, on new crew members needing to get to used, used to a new service at the same time. Because we're still, for example, having about 20% about of the staff at the minute aren't in and are either on long-term isolation or they're vulnerable or they're sheltering with other members of their family. And those are the people who've got the knowledge on how the service works. And when you've got that knowledge missing, that's when you get problems in how the service works. One of my big um, wishes and aims in terms of coming on as a portfolio um, has been, I've inherited a certain way of doing the service. And one of the things I'm looking to do is try and change things incrementally. Historically, with things like waste services, you tend to have a, every seven or eight years, you have a big bang approach and everything changes, you get new vehicles, the way you work changes, what you collect changes. One of the things that's very noticeable from my time um, looking after this area of the council is that people are looking for us to move faster with things like recycling and the materials we collect. And that's tricky to do with the way that these services work traditionally. You tend to have long-term contracts. People want to do things for six or seven years. We buy a vehicle for £166,000 and then we expect to carry that cost over six or seven years. And one of the things we're looking at in the waste team is how we start to make those little changes and improvements over time that residents would like to see and let us react better to the fact that things like Blue Panic come along and people feel differently about plastics or COVID comes along and it changes the way that we are dealing with paper and cardboard recycling and how much of the, the, that there is. So a lot of those things are now looking at how can we take what we've learned, what's happened, what we've got in terms of the service now and start making those changes year on year to improve it and make it more responsive to what residents would like to see. Thanks, um, thanks Andy. I think, I think for me, you know, a lot of people mentioned, oh, well, West Oxfordshire still had a garden waste service, we had to suspend ours. I think, you know, the lesson that I'm taking, I'm sure the same goes for you, is we, we probably need to build more resilience into, into some areas, don't we? So when we do have a unforeseen circumstance, clearly a global pandemic, as you say, is um, it's somewhere on the risk register, but it's probably, you know, you don't, you don't get one 
every few years. It's usually what, every 100 years. Yeah, so and building um, resilience, would that be something that... Yeah, and it's also quid pro quo. So a lot of people have kind of chucked comparisons with places like Stroud, for example, in my direction. And that's an interesting one because Stroud have... They have a simpler collection strategy, but they have different problems. They're smaller than the Cotswolds. But if you've ever tried, as I have, to help somebody move into a house in the middle of Stroud, it is quite an entertaining exercise when everything is 50 metres from a road and it's a complete nightmare to move anything. So some of their bin lorries, for example, go down to the size of pickup trucks. And that's actually for them one of their collection vehicles because they need to navigate them around difficult places. But they've responded to things like garden waste, for example. They were a very big pusher on food. And they've done that quite a bit earlier than us in terms of having a standalone collection, so that's well established and well understood. And what they, for example, have done is their garden waste service has been more expensive, so they can have got more resources they can use on it. They've also introduced things like waiting lists. So, for example, whereas we have to worry about how many people will subscribe, have we got enough vehicles, they're very clear. We don't have any room at the minute. When enough people sign up to the service, we can roll out another vehicle, we can roll out another part of the system. Also, simpler things, for example, they use smaller bins. So their bins are about 60 litres smaller than the ones we use, and that makes a huge difference the amount of material they need to collect for things like their garden waste service and their residual waste services, because you literally can't fit as much in as a resident. And that's a conscious decision they've taken over a number of years, and it's part of their strategy of driving down the amount of that kind of material they've got going on and driving up the amount of recyclable material. Is that stick and carrot approach of pushing people to do more of those things? And those things done over a long time have a big effect on how the service reacts and how resilient it is when you have problems coming in. Um, and particularly, as I sort of you make the comparison between a service that's quite complex, like the one that we've inherited and are running, and one that is more simple, less containers involved, which is the kind of thing you're running in somewhere like Stroud, also in somewhere like West Oxfordshire. Um, and that's one of the things that's slightly maddening, I've found, is the fact that it varies so much across the county. You would have hoped there'd be more consistency. We could all join in with shared schemes. We could send our waste off to the same places. But that nationally doesn't happen enough, and it certainly doesn't yet happen enough at a county level. And that also means that if, for example, we wanted to help out West Oxfordshire, or they wanted to help us out, we have the wrong kind of vehicles. Their collection is not the same as our collection, so you can't move vehicles between different locations. It's coming in as someone fresh from the outside. It's all a bit maddening. And that, again, becomes part of those incremental improvements we'd like to see. So we can share resources, share capability, share resilience with other authorities. Thanks, um, thanks, Andy. Some comments trickling through. And Rick Harding, love this programme. It should be on twice a week. <laughs> Rick, thank you. Please know. Um, yeah, please know, my <laughs> colleagues say. Um, I really appreciate that, but we do have to try and um, run the council. I'm lucky in that I get to do this full time, but my colleagues, I know, also have other jobs. So, um, so it might be a little bit unfair on them. But I think what we will do is, even after the pandemic's over and, you know, into the future, we'll make sure that we continue to do a form of these. Um, you know, if we can do it from the Barn Theatre, great. But I think, you know, even if we can't, I think this has been a really useful way of engaging with people and just doing doing something slightly differently. I don't know if you guys would agree, mm. yeah? Um, so, yeah, thank you for your kind words. Um, one of my constituents, Jane Doney. I'm not on my sofa. I'm watching on my sun lounger. <laughs> Jane, thank you for that image. Um, <laughs> And actually, we've got, some, we've got some debate, actually, about... And I guess this is where the issue has arisen um, with the government's announcement. So Mark Haller, correct answer is no to travelling to meet family. Um, in the, um, it's as clear as mud in the guidance. Um, da -da 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 -da. The problem Can I just is, pick up on yeah, that go on, point, go, actually, go. where... Um, so where someone said about, you know, doing the programme more often. That, that's one of the interesting things for me. There is an assumption developed a lot over time that politicians are either idiots or they don't give a stuff about anything. Um, and I'd like to think that none of us who are actually doing this are in either of those categories. Mm. So one of the nice things about this is it lets us go into a bit more detail about why certain things are. Mm. The garden waste decision was really impactful for quite a few people for whom gardening is a really big thing. And we didn't stop it lightly. Um, and I've had lots of email correspondence with people about the specific reasons why. And so one of the useful things of being able to talk more with you and have that dialogue with questions and answer questions and respond to things you're asking about and inquiring about is a chance to explain 
the constraints we work under, why certain things happen, where we're trying to get to, why a thing you may not like happened, but how we're going to move on from that and get to the next thing. And I think particularly when, and that's not just us, that's local authorities, that's the government, that's people like the World Health Organization, all these kind of things are uncharted territory. So being able to share a bit more about why certain decisions happen in a particular way and why what outcomes we're trying to aim for is also useful for us. So you can have that dialogue and it can be clear we're trying to make the right decisions and to have the right approaches to help us get through these kinds of situations. Because I think sometimes it's not always clear that that's what we're trying to do. Mm. But that is, that's why I'm here. That's what we're about as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Absolutely. Um, Jenny, do you want to have a stab at this? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. You don't have to. Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to answer. We can always, as I said, anything we can't answer, we'll make sure that we follow up on. Um, it's addressed to me, but I'm going to pass it tact okay. tact you know, tactically to you, Jenny, because um, you probably have more dealings with than I have. Do you agree with the fact that universal credit has been increased, increased, but not job seekers or income support? Um, are these not support for the most vulnerable too? Good point. It is a good point. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think one of the things that we've um, we've learnt throughout all of this is that actually by helping and supporting our most vulnerable we actually make our <coughs> communities and our neighbourhoods much more resilient and stronger um, and I know that um, you know uh, tagging on to what Andy's just said that um, we are working in um, amongst my officers looking at all the good actually that has come out of this that we can take forward so we actually don't really want to go back to how things were before in a lot of cases. We want to um, seize on some of the opportunities that have come about as a result of this. Uh, you know, a bit more of a caring society where, um, you know, I learned the other day that actually the number of people that have applied to be um, nurses in this country has shot through the roof. You know, just goes to show that when you um, give people um, a bit of status and you value what they uh, contribute to society, that that can be something that drives people to want to do certain things and to serve um, other people in public sector. So um, I think there's lots of things that we want to take out of this about the way that we treat our vulnerable. Um, and absolutely, yes, I agree. Yeah, and I'd agree with that as well. And I'd also say that clearly, you know, in a lot, most income support, job seekers and universal credit... Um, it's not a district council function or responsibility. Having said that, that's not to say we won't lobby to make sure that things are fairer. What we have done in the last year is we've made the council tax support scheme that we are responsible for a lot fairer. We've taken, we've actually taken hundreds of people out of paying council tax altogether, um, which is a progressive step. It means people have more, more money in their pocket, um, particularly at the minute with COVID-19, that's, that's helpful, um, particularly as incomes are squeezed. So if you are, in need of support or help, get onto the council's website, um, Google Council Tax Support Cotswold, and you'll find information there. But there are ways that we can that we can help as a district council. Just get in touch, have a chat with our customer services team. They're really really friendly, and they'll um, they'll they'll help you with any support you need. Question from Holly Wright, um, Jenny, one for you. What are councils doing to protect those with disabilities and mental health disorders? Um. Yes, so the, well, the same as we've always done, and um, we have, as Joe just said, we have a team, um, a customer services team, who are there to uh, um, help with signposting or just listening to um, any uh, challenges that you might have or any adjustments that you need us to make in order that you can access um, the same support um, as, as anyone else. So, um, yeah, we would just urge you to get in touch with us. Um, all of our uh, contact details are uh, visible to the public and I, I receive um, emails and phone calls all the time from people um, wanting us to change things or look into things. Um, so if there is anything that you um, feel that you haven't got access to, then, then let us know. I've got another question here from Rosemary Andrews. Rosemary, you're a frequent commenter. <laughs> good, to have you. good to have you watching. We're delighted to have you. Um, there was talk today that a large number of those who should be protected had not received government letters. Has this also been the case here in the Cotswolds? Um, we're not aware of that. Um, we have spent a lot of time um, personally ringing um, those in the shielded community to um, check that they are getting everything that they need, particularly in, in terms of access to food and medicine. 
and I know that the County Council are also ringing around um, the shielded community. We have also um, received uh, contact from people who believe that they should be in that, who might not have received um, letters, and we have also picked up on those as well. Um, we also took some time over recent weeks, didn't we, Joe? Um, mm -hmm. Ringing um, the members, actually ringing uh, people on our assisted waste collections list, um, because we identified that might be a group that um, might not necessarily be on the shielded list, but might, for whatever reason or other, um, have problem accessing um, support and um, they might need some, some help. So we have gone out of our way to um, make contact with all areas of, um, of our uh, community and our residents to check that they're okay. Great. Um, Andy, you've got a couple of questions here that are quite specific about when waste is going to be collected. So Tammy Hughes, um, <laughs> when is the waste collection going to start up in Chesterton? When is it due? Um, clearly, if you can remember that off the top of your head, I'm quite <laughs> impressed. But um, what would your advice be to people if they want to find Definitely out so. when their next collection is? I have not memorised all 45,067. <laughs> oh, um, though I have memorised the list, <laughs> but in terms of when everyone's collection is. Um, uh, simple advice, go on the website, um, follow through for the bins and recycling, when's my collection day page, go on there, stick in your address, it should recognise you, and then it'll tell you when your collections are. Um, and that's both food, your normal recycling, residual waste collections, and also, depending on where you are in that restart cycle, when the garden waste collection would be, if you're an existing subscriber already. I think the thing to say as well, customer service, we want to hear back from you. Let us know what it's like navigating the website. It's a relatively new website. We've tried to streamline it and make it a bit simpler. Let us know what you think. If you think that something's particularly difficult to find, then that's feedback we can go away and we can get it changed. Somebody mentioned the other day they were trying to find who their local councillor was and they said it was quite hard to find. That's something I'm going to take back and we're going to work with. So we really, we really, really, um, we really, really welcome feedback. Um, so, folks, I think we're going to we're going to start um, wrapping up now. But I just want to sort of end with a just a brief discussion about recovery because we've had the first peak of the um, of the virus. We want to try now and avoid a second peak, and if we can, uh, avoid it altogether. Um, but as a council, we need to get back to some sort of business as normal. But We've got to be honest that business as normal probably isn't going to be what we've seen in the past. It's a bit of a cliche. We keep hearing the term the new normal, don't we? Mm -hmm. But it is where we're at and we need, to, we need to embrace it and we need to make sure we're prepared for it. So as we move forward over the next few weeks, please let us know. What do you want, to, what do you want the council's priorities to be? Help inform us. We've, you know, we know what we'd like to do, but we want to make sure that they strike a chord with you. So we're always looking for feedback. We're always looking for comments on that. Quite often, councils will go out to consultation and um, we'll get 20 responses. They're usually from the same people and they're not particularly helpful. Councils have a job to do to try and improve communications with residents. One of the ways that we're trying to do this is what we've been doing for the past few weeks. And as we move forward, we know that we need to get better at communication. But please, engage with us and let us know. Andy, just to sort of, I'll go, I'll go to both of you. What does recovery look like for you? And this isn't a pro. I haven't, we haven't prepared any of these questions, so you're probably, it's probably better shooting from the hip. What does recovery look like? And I think, well, I've, I've got to worry that kind of recovery is difficult. I think looking around a lot of other parts of the world and even in countries that have kind of handled it well, should we say in quotes, you've got places like Australia and New Zealand talking about mm, nobody's allowed in until October. You've got places like Taiwan saying, well, nobody's coming in until there's a vaccine. So it's hard to see how anything resembling the world we have known before with the travel and people and goods and things moving around. I suppose more locally, there's kind of um, fairly parochial things like getting things at the waste service exactly the way that we would like it and running again normally. But behind the scenes, I mean, a big one for me is climate change, for example, hasn't gone away. It is still an issue. It comes back as soon as we all start driving and flying and doing all the other things more. So some of those things that would have become business as usual for us in terms of the sticks and carrots of helping you with guiding behaviour to reduce carbon footprint, to increase the amount of recycling, to reduce the amount that we're throwing away. All of those things for me, getting back into being able to talk about those and deliver those will be a big part of the recovery for me. And also that crosses across into things like flooding. 
it's very dry at the minute. For all I know, we'll go through another wet winter. There's also lots of kind of infrastructure work we've been working and talking to partners about in terms of improving drainage and where water goes and capacity to hold on to floodwaters. A lot of that stuff is a bit difficult to do at the minute. So starting to get those programs and those pieces of work up and running again will be important. And then the other part of my portfolio is a lot around kind of the environmental side. So again, it's back to things like being able to go out and do environmental monitoring the way we would normally, looking out for the health of rivers and these kinds of things, and picking up all those things and looking after both that big environment in the climate sense and the local environment that we're so lucky to have in the Cotswolds. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Um, Jenny, what does recovery look like to you? And, um, you know, in your role as a cabinet member and indeed as an individual. Yeah, I think it's, um, it was quite interesting the other day on uh, uh, Radio 4, it sounds a bit of a sad middle class thing to say, but on Radio 4 they were talking about whether or not the bird singing was actually louder at the moment. Um, and, and they actually uh, deduced that it isn't louder, it's just that the background noise is quieter and that actually the birds might be singing even quieter than normal, it's just that we can hear them. And I kind of feel like it's a bit like that for us at the moment, in that we've got an opportunity, um, whilst everything's just a bit quieter, to kind of look at the way we've been doing things and think, is this the way we want to continue? Is this the way we want to go back? And we will actually shortly be getting in contact with our residents um, through my health and wellbeing team to ask them what it is that they've liked what they've enjoyed what opportunities they've um they've seized you know i've got lots of um uh, my communities who have really pulled together like at no other time and have got to know that really know their neighbors and support them through this um, but also there are things going on such as zoom you know village zoom quizzes and all sorts of online events um, people that are embracing technology like never before um, I was talking to a doctor friend of mine who said you know we are trialing um, online online diagnosis and we are trialing um, things that we it would have taken us years and years to even you know get some kind of pilot going um, but we've been forced to do it and it's working really well so I think there are lots of things we've been kind of forced into that actually we might want to continue doing and also I'm yet to hear anybody say I can't wait to get back to commuting so I think there are some things there that we can look at in terms of how we can support our residents to maybe continue to uh, work from home more um, and therefore they'll be accessing um, the outdoors here um, and uh, they'll be ploughing their their money and their resources into our local economy rather than taking them out of the area to to London or wherever so um, we I feel very positive but then I am an eternal optimist um, that we've got lots of opportunities to do things differently and do things better and sometimes um, we might have sped up some of the things that might have taken years to implement thanks Jenny before I round up I've just seen a question from Anne Gollix who asked it last week, but we weren't able to come to it, and I very nearly forgot. It didn't go into my pack. So, Anne, I will, I will answer this for you, and it sort of ties into that theme, really, about the new normal. Um, thank you to all of those at CDC who are working hard to keep things running for the district during these difficult and unprecedented times. We are moving into a new normal, and no one knows what, inta what that entails, um, nor how different, uh, different our patterns of life will be over the coming years. Given this huge uncertainty, will CDC be shelving plans um, for the Waterloo car park until such a time <laughs> that the new normal um, car parking needs are properly ex assessed? Furthermore, given the considerable drain on council finances caused by the coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic, would CDC even consider adding to the financial burden of the district with a colossal loan that the Waterloo car park re would require? That's a good point, um, Anne, and I think, yeah, we need to review everything. Clearly, the new normal, will people be using cars in the same way? Will they be commuting in the same way? All of those things need to be weighed up. So while we haven't made a decision as yet, you can, you've can you got it from me and indeed Jenny, who you're on the parking board, aren't you? Yeah. And indeed from Jenny, that we will of course be reviewing everything. You know, this is an unprecedented time. It's shaking everything to the core, so we'll need to review everything. So at the minute, um, Waterloo car park plans still stand, but we will be reviewing that in the coming weeks and months, um, probably sooner rather than later, about whether we want to delay that or indeed um, perhaps whether we will actually want to continue with it um, at all and whether it is needed. So we will, of course, 
keep residents up to date as that goes along. We will continue to have our residence forums, etc. So um, we'll make sure that you, know, you are appraised and everybody that's concerned with that. Thank you, Anne. Um, yeah, that's that's us for today. Then um, in the next few days, I'm going to be doing a another address to the um, to the to the district. A bit of a a bit of an update about where we're at as a council and the way I see things going forward. So keep an eye out for that. But while I was sort of putting my speech together for that, I was sort of reflecting on, you know, our district and the state of our district, if you like. And actually, I think we've seen that in the, in the last few weeks and months with communities going above and beyond. Usually every week we have a feature about communities that are doing amazing things in their communities, be it the community in Tetbury that um, have really put together a fantastic, um, a fantastic choice of where you can get food delivered, um, you know, great menu, a great, great variety there. Or up in Borton on the Water where people have mucked together to you know, help protect the vulnerable and the elderly. There are examples right across the Cotswolds of absolutely amazing amazing um, instances that really bring the community together and really it highlights that the state of our district despite this awful pandemic and the hardship and tragic loss that many people have suffered the state of our district is strong so i will leave you with that thank you very much for watching um, we'll be back to normal next week with a slightly more packed show thank you very much for joining us see you next week thank you In March 2018, we opened our doors to the public with a vision not just to create challenging professional theatre, but to use this as a platform to inspire and bring communities together. In March 2018, we opened our doors to the public with a vision not just to create challenging professional theatre, but to use this as a platform to inspire and bring communities together. Theatre and culture build identity. With theatre and culture in our local life, the community landscape is more vibrant. Local life is enriched. We believe that the benefits of theatre should be available for everyone. Our Theatre for All programme has removed financial barriers giving disadvantaged people access to the theatre free of charge. So we were told that we'd come here and have a Christmas meal and then go and watch A Christmas Carol. Our aim is to make live professional theatre available to everyone and use that experience for positive change. Theatre can be transformational in young lives. Our academy is now in its fourth year and we continue to build on our vision of bringing the best performing arts tuition to the heart of the Cotswolds. We work hard to make our academy as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Discounts apply for parents with more than one child. Our bursaries help support talented children from less affluent backgrounds. The Academy creates a fun and challenging environment where children can build friendships and develop key skills not just for theatre, but for life. We are also able to provide real opportunities for students who wish to pursue careers in the arts. My name is Harry Apps. I am currently playing Marius in Les Miserables in the West End. Barn outreach and learning programmes engage with thousands of people. Our free workshops support the drama curriculum in local schools. Singing and musical theatre workshops in community groups and care homes have helped address issues of isolation. Our Song for Sirencester project in aid of mental health charities brought our community together in an unprecedented way. We've collaborated with many charities in the region, including the Churn Project, to support individuals dealing with the barriers to finding work. 
Since working with Yuan, my life's changed. It's given me some purpose, given me an interest, some confidence I was lacking prior to all this. The Barn Theatre played a pivotal role in the town's 2018 World War I centenary celebrations. Who could forget our record-breaking human poppy? Our live streaming work on the annual Advent Festival helped thousands engage and take part in Sirencester's Christmas festivities. In these times of uncertainty, we strive to keep the community together. The theatre may be temporarily closed, but our commitment to you goes on. Even now, our amazing costume department are helping the NHS by making scrubs for frontline workers. We've used our technology to build a free live streaming service that provides much needed community news and entertainment for all the family. Broadcasting every day to keep us all connected. We are not just a theatre. We are the bar.